Today we're joined by uh, Lauren Collins, who is the author of Bull Spotting. Uh, he has been published in the Atlanta Journal Constitution on the topics of misinformation and critical thinking. Uh, Lauren, thanks very much for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Excellent. So, look, let's start right from the top. Can you tell us a little bit about your book, Bull Spotting, and uh, what was the uh, purpose behind it initially? Sure. Um, yeah, Bull Spotting came out uh, almost exactly uh, five years ago. Uh, I actually had it pop up in my Facebook feed the other day, the, the video of me opening the box of, uh, of, of it coming in the mail for the first time. Um, I, I wrote it uh, because I'd gotten – interested and a little bit engaged in sort of uh, organized skepticism. Uh, specifically, what, the genesis of the book came from uh, my own personal involvement uh, in terms of the part of skepticism that I engaged in the most, uh, dealt with uh, certain conspiracy theorists uh, here in the U.S. that were you know, dubbed the birthers, uh, the conspiracy theorists regarding Obama's birth and his life. Um, and uh, I, I ran a blog uh, about the, the birthers and various claims they made about President Obama at the time. Um, and part of me wanted to turn this into a book. When I turned that into a pitch, pitched it uh, to a couple of companies, one of them came back. I, I'd structured it kind of as using birtherism as sort of a field guide to skepticism at large. And they liked the idea of sort of the field guide attitude towards critical thinking and towards skepticism, but wanted me to take on topics larger than just the one. Uh, so that's what I adapted. I did a whole bunch of research um, and, and turned all those different stories uh, into what eventually became bull spotting. And uh, it's probably one of the questions to have. There's a lot of budding authors out there and, and uh one of the things that they want to know is how do they even go out and approach a book deal? Oftentimes they write a book and then try to get it out. What was the process like for you as a, as a new author in that space to, you know, to pitch the idea and then to get a deal to actually write? For me, uh, I, I did a little bit of research online as to what it, I had to sort of put together in terms of a pitch. Uh, what, what were the aspects of a pitch? So I could sort of have something reasonably professional looking as I reached out. Uh, I looked up a few agents early on, uh, thinking that obviously the first thing I should do is to find myself an agent, and the agent can pitch it, uh, my proposal, to different publishers. Uh, none of them bit on that idea, uh, including a friend of mine, actually, who was a uh, book agent, but she dealt mostly with uh, things other than, say, political or w what this eventually got uh, classified as was philosophy, of all things. Um, and then at some point, I discovered Prometheus, uh, Prometheus Books, which is who published Bull Spotting in the end. And Prometheus had two things that were in my favor. Uh, well, you know, one was that they are a publisher of a lot of skeptical literature. Uh, if anyone uh, in the listening audience has ever heard of The Amazing Randy, who is a, a, a well-known skeptic and magician for a number of years, uh, several of his books have been published through Prometheus. Uh, various other skeptical authors have been published by Prometheus. So they're a publisher who already deals in the field I'm writing in. And secondly, they took just open submissions and pitches from authors. You didn't have to reach out to them through an agent, like if you were trying to reach Random House or something like that. So I sent my pitch directly to Prometheus. They liked it. They were the ones who had me sort of rewrite it some, uh, rewrite the pitch somewhat to be a little broader in terms of subject matter. Uh, they then offered me a contract. Uh, in my normal life, I am an attorney, but I deal mostly in uh, accident cases, injury, and whatnot. I, I don't know an awful lot about book contracts. Uh, so once I was offered a contract, I reached out to, again, a friend of mine who was an agent. Once I had a contract in hand, she was more than happy to represent me. Um, and she you know, was able to draw up the terms to be a little bit more favorable for me. Um, and then I had my time frame to get the book done and turned it in, and uh, some months later it got published. Um, so th that was the way I did it, was a, a few dead ends up there at the start until I, I found 
an avenue that I could pursue myself. And you mentioned uh, initially you brought to the table this idea of um, the, the birther ideology, at which point they decided to sort of expand on it. So uh, can you talk to us about key themes in the book and also what it was like having to work with a book publisher? Because I imagine there was a little bit of you know, give and take in terms of their expectations of what you'd be penning. Sure. Um, like I said, the, the original pitch was – taking different aspects of birtherism um, because it was as deeply involved as I was in debunking uh, their claims. Uh, they touched on a lot more things than just claiming that the president was born in Kenya. They, they had various kind of people claiming to have scientific expertise, claiming to dissect images of his birth certificate. They had people claiming to know, you know, history about the state of Hawaii or about Kenya or about, in some cases, Indonesia. Oftentimes, this information is completely wrong, but uh, they were advancing these claims nonetheless. Uh, there was this whole field uh, of self-proclaimed legal experts uh, and a couple of fringe attorneys uh, who made various really unfounded legal claims as to whether Obama was eligible to be president under the U.S. Constitution. Again, none of these legal claims held any water, but they were writing whole little self-published treatises on the web about it. So, uh, so here, here we're touching on like base sorts of pseudo-scientific aspects, uh, touching on pseudo-history, touching on pseudo-law. Um, you're having pe general denialism, obviously people denying that the president was born in Hawaii, uh, various conspiracy theories that were then being advanced to explain away all of these things, all kinds of rumors. So I, w I was going to use birtherism to touch on all these different subjects, but denialism and conspiracy theories and pseudo-history and so on. Um, and those ended up being, again, with broader examples, the subjects that I cover in bull spotting, um, talking about uh, denialism, for instance, and dealing with people who deny that the earth is uh, ancient, for instance, people who want to claim that the earth is only 6,000 years old, uh, uh, dealing with uh, sort of pseudo-history, uh, people who might want to claim that uh, Atlantis existed, or pseudoscience, there's an entire field of cryptozoology where people claim that various monsters, uh, whether it be Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, or in some cases more fanciful things. Um, and the, my discussion of pseudo-law was largely sort of U.S.-specific. Uh, various people who claim that uh, the U.S. tax code doesn't apply to them. You know, that the, the, it, it basically the income tax is optional if you know the right tricks to play. Uh, or... Uh, I've seen a few of these videos um, online while, while I was reading a bit oh, of your yeah. background about these, this sort of movement of, of sovereign citizens and, and this new libertarianism that, that seems to be um, growing in a lot of regions of, uh, of the U.S. Yes, and the sovereign citizen movement has been around for a while. I've been tempted to write about them more at length. Um, they were obviously around for any number of years before I wrote the book. They have sadly only become more prominent and more well-known in the last five years. Um, but and, and a lot of pseudo-legal claims tie back one way or the other to sovereign citizens. Uh, since they've sort of developed their own little internal culture and logic as to how the law sh exists and how it should apply to them. And um, this is this is interesting because of your uh, background in in Atlanta, Georgia, and you know obviously I don't live in America, but as you probably be well aware, um, the southern states has a has a bit of its own reputation both nationally and, and internationally. And when you uh, started writing the book, there's the intro of it goes through. Uh, you know, your own family's rich uh, background of Southern heritage and how you ended up changing your position on the Confederate flag. D do you want to, um, well, first of all, for listeners, just explain that, but also, you know, maybe elaborate on um, on Confederate and Southern history and, and its place in the American South? Oh, I'd love to. Um, yes, as I explain in, in, in my introduction, uh, to sort of give a 
personal touch and sort of my origin story for how I sort of became a skeptic. Um, I am a lifelong Southerner. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my family has been in Georgia specifically uh, for uh, close to 200 years. Uh, and in the South for, I think, a century more than that, at least. Um, so our, 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 our roots run pretty deep here. And so having grown up in the South, I had grown up with sort of that, the culture of uh, the sort of lost cause of the Confederacy. Um, I, I was sort of acculturated to think of the Civil War as the war between the states, and that the Civil War had been fought over, you know, the issues of states' rights, that, uh, you know, slavery was there, but that's not what the Confederacy was really fighting for, is what we were, you know, uh, sort of not taught in school, but just sort of, again, acculturated to believe. Um, uh, I mean, even for myself, it, it, it's a, it'd be comforting to think that. Uh, part of my heritage uh, here in the South is that e even just directly in my family tree, I have five Confederate soldiers uh, that I'm directly descended from, and that's not even getting into you know, uncles and other kinds of ancillary uh, members of the family. Um, and so that's the way I came up uh, pretty much at least up through high school, give or take. Uh, I went to the University of Georgia for my undergraduate education here, here in Athens, Georgia. Um, and while I was there, this was around 2000 uh, on either side of that, uh, that was when Georgia had a major controversy going on about our state flag. Uh, the state flag of Georgia at the time, as since the 19... 60s at least, possibly the 1950s. I think it was the 50s. Uh, the, for about half a century, the Georgia flag had been redesigned to incorporate the battle flag of the Confederacy. And so this sort of came to a head in the late 90s with people objecting to the fact that our state flag included symbolism from the Confederacy. And so in the early 2000s, there was a push to change this there was some pushback. There were fraternities, for instance, in Georgia that would sometimes fly the Confederate flag or continue to fly the the old Georgia flag even if, even after it had been changed. And during all this time, one of the things I wanted to do um, was initially to sort of look into the Confederacy myself. And I thought, with all, all this debate back and forth of what the Confederacy stood for, I thought at the time, what would be a good way to sort of recapture uh, the sort of dignity of, you know, again, the Confederate ancestors I had, which would be to sort of find these references. Uh, I, would, I, I thought I would set out to find references from early on in the war, finding the Confederate political leaders and possibly the military leaders where maybe they were saying this was about states' rights, this was not about slavery. I thought I, I, thought I could find those. So I went looking for them um, in uh, what was available on the Internet at the time, and I was somewhat distressed to suddenly discover that they were saying exactly the opposite, that when you search out the statements that Confederate leaders were making right at the time the South seceded, they were abundantly clear that they were seceding about slavery. Um, the state of Mississippi had a uh, declaration of secession that said, I think in its opening sentence, that their, um, their action in seceding from the United States was fully associated with slavery. Uh, the governor of Georgia at the time wrote an open letter to the people of Georgia, uh, who for the most part were pretty poor and not slave owners, trying to convince them that you should support secession even though you don't own slaves because slavery is still important to you. Uh, the state of Georgia sent a 
uh, delegate to the Virginia Secession Convention. Uh, and while he was there, he, again, made it very clear this is about slavery. Over and over again, in the early days of when the states were seceding, in the early days of the war, they said repeatedly secession was about slavery. Uh, and then it was only at once the war was over and they had lost, and this looked bad for history, that they all kind of started retconning and retroactively changing what that agenda had been because that looked bad for them and bad for the South in, in retrospect. Um, is, is that visible? Like, can you, is, is there evidence of, um, you know, doctoring of, of text or speeches uh, uh, or from it, It's not doctoring text. It's just, for, for instance, um, uh, Alexander Stevens was a Georgian. He was uh, the vice president of the Confederacy. And he gave a speech, uh, I think, I, it was, I want to say it was like March of 1861. It was shortly before the Civil War began. Uh, he gave this barn burner of a speech in Savannah, Georgia, where he said that slavery was the cornerstone of the Confederacy and that the Confederacy was the first nation in the history of the world built upon the truth that the white man was superior. Um, it, it is this cornerstone speech of uh, Stevens is, is one of the most often cited uh, passages to show that this is what the Confederacy's mission was about. Um, after Stephen survived the war, he, he wrote some memoirs in, I want to say, in the early 1880s, 1870s, 1880s. And so a decade after the war, when he's suddenly writing about living through the Confederacy in those memoirs, he paints a very different picture of it. In, in those memoirs, suddenly it's all about states' rights and just sort of fighting northern oppression and that sort of thing. So it's not a matter of rewriting text. It's just a matter of after the fact, when everyone in various Southerners are reflecting back on the war, all of their history that they were writing later just sort of ignores his cornerstone speech. It ignores those declarations of secession and just sort of concocts other rationales that they then just sort of say this is what – we were feeling at the time. Um, and what they'll often cite to, instead of uh, citing to, again, the Cornerstone speech, they'll point to, say, a speech that the president of the Confederacy gave where he simply didn't mention slavery. And they'll point to that as like, ah, he didn't mention slavery, therefore it wasn't about slavery. It's like, he's, it's a speech to the military. He's not really talking about what the Confederacy's mission is. The fact that he didn't mention slavery doesn't mean that it's not that. You, you've simply identified a speech where it didn't come up. But if that's, that uh, remains to this day, um, uh, that speech of Jefferson Davis as the Confederacy's president, one of the most often cited bits of proof, uh, proof in quotes, that Confederate defenders will use. So it's, it's probably a much larger question then, but um, you know, when dealing with that, how do Southerners reconcile their past with the desire to be proud of their history when, you know, the country is now talking about banning the Confederate flag and, and even further steps in the removal of statues and, and those sorts of things? It's incredibly contentious here. Um, and I, I've seen it in Georgia, again, going back 20 years, because we Georgia specifically started going through this with our state flag. Um, and so it, it becomes a fight uh, for various people, because they want to identify symbol symbology of the Confederacy as being very much intertwined with Southern heritage. Um, and from the very first thing I wrote on the Confederacy, which was for the U uh, the University of Georgia student newspaper uh, when I was there in law school, I, I, I stressed very hard after I had quoted all these Confederate leaders to stress for myself, that there's a lot that people can be proud of as Southerners. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's literature, there's art, there's cuisine, there's, you know, uh, all other aspects of our history. But for whatever reason, the Confederacy, those, those four years in the 1860s uh, that suddenly got memorialized at various points throughout our history, through statues, through flags, um, through other imagery, uh, 
people want to hold on to those, and then when we recognize this is what the Confederacy is about, even if, even when you lay out this is what the Confederacy was about, um, they want to treat removing that sim, you know those symbols, removing those images as some kind of attack on their heritage. Um, and it, again, it's something I felt some somewhat growing up. It, it's something I had to educate myself out of. Um, the big difference I see now is that the a lot of the information I had to search out when I was in college is readily available now. It is re regularly quoted in articles and um, op-eds and uh, other presentations about the Confederacy. Um, uh and, and what are your, your thoughts on these these general attempts to whitewash history? It's it's quite astounding to me now that regardless of history and whether it's good or bad, uh, the way um, uh, modern society now seems to go, we don't agree with it. Therefore, we'll just try to erase it and pretend that it, it never happened in the first place. And, and th that's the sort of thing I hear. I, I hear the whitewashing charge raised, for instance, with uh, Confederate statues. We, we've heard that a lot lately. And, and I think referring to it as whitewashing is sort of uh, miscapturing what's going on, I, I, because I don't think anyone's trying to whitewash history of the Confederacy. Um, I, I think what people want to do is to sort of bring to the forefront what the Confederacy was um, in, in, in its own opinion of itself at the time. Um, what we... What we're not trying to do, what what we don't want to do is to continue to sort of honor that ugly part of our heritage um, through memorials, um, through again uh, honorary symbology, recognizing it sort of in the state flag, for instance, when it offends people so much. But it's it's certainly not a matter of trying to whitewash history. No, no one is. Suggesting taking the you know the Civil War uh, out of schools uh, or n not not discussing that aspect of the history. I mean, it is easily <laughs> uh, a major part of American history, if not the the, the most Im important four single single years uh, on American soil. Um, but it's just a matter of what's the right context to present and to discuss and to uh, sort of display that history going forward. Okay. Um, you, uh, <clears throat> on some of the background information I've read on you as well, you, you describe yourself more as a, a classical liberal, who uh, I mm -hmm. assume would skew more towards, um, I guess what I would call more of a traditional re Republican agenda that's more aligned with uh, personalities like Goldwater. But uh, a lot of topics in the book would be considered you know, more Democrat-leaning in a lot of regards. So, you know, where does your political philosophy uh, really sit, and, and how does that sort of fit in with a, a state like Georgia, where you're from? Um, my, uh, classical liberal is, is still the, the term I, I prefer. Um, in, in some ways, uh, I, I, I lean a little libertarian, uh, even though I, I, uh, I, I last associated with the Libertarian Party uh, when I was in college. Um, and in, in fact, a couple of years ago, uh, two years ago, in fact, um, I actually ran for the state house, uh, here in Georgia. I noticed there's uh, a, and, a and vote, vote Lauren website that exists up here. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and I actually ran as a Republican in that race, but being that there were four candidates in the race and, uh, there were three Republicans, uh, I, I sort of came up on the tail end of that, um, my, uh, my my political philosophy these days uh, is, unfortunately, in some degrees, mostly driven by my antipathy towards Donald Trump. Okay. Uh, uh, th th his election was what finally, after a, a year or so of identifying as a Republican, uh, made me want to back off that label, at least. Um, th there is still a sort of a desire in me that I'd like to see the Republican Party sort of reformed in a in a direction that I'd be more comfortable with because the, the, there's a lot of uh, the 
underlying elements of the GOP that I like in terms of free markets, um, in terms of li limited government, um, in terms of what I generally see as, and this ties back to the book, um, just sort of skepticism, to be honest, uh, my, my sort of default mode towards any sort of government action is skepticism of whether or not this is going to uh, be efficacious, whether or not there are going to be any sort of unanticipated side effects. Um, and uh, unfortunately, at the moment, that's not the direction the, the GOP is headed in. <laughs> so let's, um, uh, let's touch on this for a moment now. My... Uh, I'm sure you can clarify for me, but my understanding is that it was actually Donald Trump many years ago who was one of the very first people to propose the birther movement. Is is that correct? He was not one of the first. Um, he uh, the, the birther movement sort of began in earnest in mid 2008, um, right around the time that uh, Barack Obama uh, clinched the primary uh, race from Hillary Clinton. Uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and, and then starting in two, then in 2008, it sort of floated around on the web. Donald Trump didn't get involved in it publicly until 2011. Um, early, uh, around February or so 2011, uh, when he was initially floating running for the 2012 uh, Republican presidential nomination. Uh, what, what's notable and in, incredibly important about Donald Trump's involvement is that whereas for those first three years, the birther movement had sort of floated around online, mostly confined to just Internet cranks and, and a couple of fringe you know, news websites. Um, you know, nothing, for instance, e even as prominent as you know, Breitbart. I mean, we're, we're talking much more fringe than that. Um, uh, what Donald Trump did when he came along and sort of publicly gave support to it in 2011 was he suddenly became, by a wide margin, the most prominent person to have spoken up in favor of it and to give it a national platform. Um, and so it was interesting, as someone who had watched this movement for close to three years at that point, uh, to see it suddenly go from just sort of a fringy online uh, conspiracy theory to suddenly being something that CNN was having to cover in earnest because here's a man who was briefly for a, a several weeks in March 2011 was polling at the head of the GOP candidates at the time who whose platform at the moment seemed to be primarily built on promoting a conspiracy theory about the sitting president. Now it, within the book, as we go through that, and you know, we'll, we'll go through Trump a little bit more, but um, mm -hmm. the book goes through and it sort of discusses that people have their own cognitive bias, and even when presented with facts, um, they they will make a conscious or subconscious choice to ignore them. So, I guess at a at more of a philosophical stance, what were you hoping to achieve by writing the book? Sort of understanding that that's the way people inherently behave and receive information. What I've learned over the years from being involved in skepticism and, and from, uh, from from hearing about various kind of studies that have, have been done in these fields is that trying to correct people's beliefs through fact-checking, through, through debunking, it is difficult um, because of the cognitive biases, because of, you know, uh, various kind of motivated reasoning and whatnot. Once someone is sort of emotionally invested in a belief, and doubly so once it's it's sort of incorporated into their worldview and into their identity, um, and that that can be their personal identity, their political identity, their you know, uh, religious identity, whatever. It becomes very difficult to pull them out of that belief without them feeling like somehow they're uh, giving up something. Uh, uh, if, if nothing else, it can leave people with sort of the, the sort of sunk cost fallacy that, you know, if they've spent time uh, advocating 
for something that now they're being told is false. You don't want to admit it's false. You've spent a lot of time and investment in this belief. Um, but yes, for various reasons, it's difficult to convince someone to give up a mistaken belief. What has to be done um, over the long term to, to keep people uh, from falling into mistaken beliefs, from, to keep people from uh, re repeating these sorts of mistakes, is to instill in them a sense of skepticism and to, to sort of educate them in the skills that are involved in critical thinking. Because, one, that can help people avoid falling for these in the first place. Um, if you understand what those cognitive biases are, if you understand what the sort of tricks, and I, I go through any number of these in the book about pseudoscience and you know, conspiracy theories and whatnot, uh, if you understand what are the warning signs uh, of this kind of misinformation, you can forestall yourself from falling forward in the first place. Uh, and so then you're not, uh, it's not up to anyone else to try to debunk it out of you later. Um, but also what the sense of critical thinking can do for you, what, what those mental skills is, it also generally instills in you sort of a sense of humility about your own fallibility and about your own uh, your own ability to to make these mistakes. And is there um, so that, is there a reason why when we hold a belief, why we consider that so uh, personal to us and, and sort of a, a form of our of our identity, where if it's questioned, you can feel attacked? Um, it, it, it's just a psychological trait. Um, uh, one of the podcasts I listened to, the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, uh, they were discussing this, I think, just uh, on the last episode, uh, or possibly two weeks ago. But, uh, but yes, uh, it, it, anytime someone sort of identifies, you know, has, has a sort of a group identity, um, has you know, an individual identity, something that matters to them, um, it, it, it's, it's just sort of natural to, to sort of tie that belief back into who you are. Um, it, it's, on its most extreme, it sort of becomes a matter of tribalism, um, and, and, and we've seen a lot more uh, of that um, in, in recent years in the U.S., especially in, in the political arena. And I was going to ask about that. So how, you know, I, growing up, I particularly remember, I'm from Canada before I moved to the U.S., so I remember sort of the Clinton administration, and then things seemed to, seemed to get really tense during the uh, first election of George W. Bush. And it, it sort of, back then, it seemed like things couldn't get any worse. But with the onset of, of the Internet, it just feels like media has splintered across the board and neither the left nor the right can agree with each other, and the the environment for dialogue is worse than it's than it's ever before been before. It, it can it be remedied, or where do you see itself going? Uh, you know, pe people said as the internet was coming along that one of the things that would uh, allow you to do, allow everyone to do, would be to um, be exposed to all kinds of different you know, opinions and information. Um, and instead, as sort of we've seen, especially in the last few years, is what it allows you to do instead um, is to sort of cultivate for yourself um, an even smaller sort of window into the world that, that you can look through, where you can find just the websites that validate your opinions. Uh, if, if, if through your social media, if, if you're following uh, just the people who support you you know the, the same political view you do, um, and, and that has that has a uh, a feedback effect. That you know, it, it, if you look at your Facebook wall and it's just all people who are sharing the same opinions you do, then it, it just strengthens your own resolve. Um, uh, it 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 it, it uh, frustrates me a little to watch people and and I see this on both sides all the time to to hear them talk about unfriending and unfollowing people because of their political beliefs, because 
that's just giving you more of an echo chamber. Um, and, uh, and the book talks about the scientific method and how common sense is not enough. So uh, is, is this an inherent trait in people? Because, you know, to be honest, you can't go out and educate the world. So how do you sort of see how people uh, intake information? And are they generally receptive to beliefs that aren't theirs in the first place? Um, no, that, 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 that's the, the challenge, is that the critical thinking and, and the scientific method in particular is not the natural way to think about things. Um, the, the, the natural way to interpret the world is largely through uh, anecdotal experience. You know, wh- what, what have I experienced? What seems true based on what I, what I have seen and heard um, and felt? Um, and the scientific method tells us that, by contrast, anecdote on its own is virtually worthless. <laughs> you know that uh, that you, you need to be able to test those uh, circumstances and controlled, you know, in a controlled environment um, uh, to, to to make sure that that effect actually is there and is not somehow just either illusory. Or if it is uh, just an outlier, uh, you know, and, and that's true in everything from you know, uh, interactions with other people to something really scientific, like you know, how does medicine affect you? Uh, to you know, how, how does the world operate at large? Um, but yes, you know, ha- having to train your mind into uh, looking at the world scientifically. And one of the aspects of the scientific method uh, and and of critical thinking, like I mentioned earlier, is that sort of sense of humility, that when you sort of test that hypothesis, when you sort of review the evidence that's coming in, to be able to look at that and recognize when it contradicts what your original hypothesis was, when it invalidates what your prior belief was, and be willing to, um, I'm sorry, um, to to recognize when it's invalidating an existing belief of yours, and to be able to accept that, step back, and sort of reevaluate and change your mind. And so, how does this play into the the greater media narrative? So, so you you know, earlier on we talked about Trump, and in my opinion, uh, you know, watching from the outside regardless of of who or whatever you think of him, I thought he was given a hard time right from the start and didn't have a fair go. I know what he said. I know the platform that he was working on, but he was effectively derided from the outset, uh, where to me, he's he's no worse of a candidate than Hillary Clinton in terms of both the narrative of how neither one of them have really done anything wrong and how great and good they could assist people. So, I mean, where do you sort of define that when, well, first of all, would you say that the candidates were sort of on, on equal footing in terms of the narrative that they presented? Or what do you think makes him worse off than someone like Hillary Clinton, who was you know, really the only other mainstream option? Um, well, I think Trump, for instance, you know, like, like I discussed earlier, in his first real foray into the presidential race back in 2011, uh, demonstrated himself to be uh, openly a conspiracy theorist, um, and and not just you know subtly, not not something that he he was you know just sort of had on the side that didn't want to discuss, but he was more than happy to promote a conspiracy theory every time he got on the air. Um, and in some of my research on specifically those few months in between when he uh, first announced he was you know, toying with the run to when he finally announced he wasn't going to, he actually became more of a conspiracy theorist in those three months on the issues. He, he, he kept adapt, uh, adopting more and more wild theories about President Obama, which he continued then to repeat in interviews, um, even though – since I had worked with them and debunked them myself over the years, knew that these things 
with any modicum of you know research, he would have known they were baseless. Um, and and that was his initial introduction into politics. Uh, and it took him over five years just to admit that he was incorrect. He never apologized for it even then. Um, That's not really his game, no, is and, it? And <laughs> uh, he, he made various acts. Well, no, it, no, it never has been. Yes. Um, and, and he made various outright lies. Uh, and, and, and I'm not talking necessarily about lies about where he'd read something online and he believed it by mistake, for instance. Um, but it, it became clear over the years, one of the interviews he gave back in 2011 was that he had investigators on the ground in Hawaii who were discovering amazing things. And it eventually became apparent he made that up in an interview. Uh, I, I forget, I want to say it was with ABC. Um, but he just it, uh, made it up out of whole cloth. He never had investigators on the ground. They weren't finding anything. But he said that straight up in an interview, and people continued to ask him to produce whatever this evidence it was. Um, that's the sort of one conspiracy mindset um, that, that I think makes, makes him unfit to be someone who is going to be in charge you know, of an executive branch. Because I think one of the things you're electing – a chief executive to do, and, and really any elected official, is you're electing them to exercise their judgment. Um, because it, it's not just on any particular issue. Obviously, people care about the individual issues, but you're trusting them to you know, make all kinds of decisions every day. And when you have someone who is you know, a conspiracy theorist, who's a denialist, um, who is openly you know, flagrantly and pathologically dishonest, this is someone whose judgment can never be trusted. So does that differ from Hillary Clinton, though, when you hear about, you know, her claims of landing under sniper fire in Bosnia or the, you know, the, the dubious connections between the Clinton Foundation and the Saudis or, you know, her words that... Um, uh, you know, sort of dismantling capitalism while she's giving quarter of a million dollar speeches to Goldman Sachs. I mean, to me, they're they're much of a muchness in, in that regard. I, uh, just I think because Hillary Clinton can can put on a face that tends to to show her as more respectable. Um, in, in my terms of I guess critical thinking, the way that you present, that they're much of a muchness as far as I see. Well, um, I. I, I... I think the uh, I think the example of the, the plane landing sort of actually illustrates the difference between them um, because for, for one it, it's uh, I'm obviously familiar but it's the standard example of you know Hillary lying um, because obviously it did not happen um, but the two big distinctions are one the fact that that has to be the the example we still go back to um, of Hillary's dishonesty means that there aren't other more frequent examples to be able to cite to that are that flagrant. Um, whereas I don't think we have to go any further back than like Monday to find an example of Trump <laughs> doing of something of equal, you know, uh, irrationality. Um, I think, in fact, just was it this morning or yesterday he claimed that he had proof of uh, some representative lying about his call to uh, um, the, the uh, widow of a soldier who was killed in Niger. And then today the White House admitted, actually, we, did, we have nothing. <laughs> we have no tape of that. Um, so that's the difference is that, one, tr Trump does this kind of thing all the time to the fact that it's possible to even index it all. Two, the, the other difference is that in Hillary's case, um, while she shouldn't have said it to her credit, when it was brought to her attention that she had not done that, she retracted it. The, you know, she she I don't remember the specifics of it, but she she did she stopped repeating that story. She apologized, you know, in whatever her way was. I don't remember, but she stopped repeating the story. A parallel for this uh, that I think actually fits really closely is. Uh, during the election last year, during the campaign last year, uh, 
Trump at one point told a story about how he remembered on 9-11 a number uh, – he, he had seen on TV a number of uh, Middle Eastern people celebrating on their rooftops in New Jersey as the towers collapsed on 9-11 in New York. And it was promptly brought to his attention that never happened at all. Um, and – I'm actually as, as dishonest as I think Trump is. I legitimately think, I legitimately think he remembers this. He has he has a, a he has a bad memory. I, I I actually am willing to trust he has a memory of this. It's a false memory, but nonetheless he remembers this. However, when it was brought to his attention, this never happened. Here's ample news footage and whatnot. This never happened. His response was not. To retract it and apologize and you know not repeat it, he continued to insist it was true, um, despite all the evidence suggesting that it had never happened. Um, and that that for instance, that's I think the difference with him is that he 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 does not allow evidence to change his mind. So does that mean? Would you go as far to say then? Do you believe that Hillary Clinton is qualified then if she? Um, still says a lot of these uh, things that, uh, you know, that there are similar to there are for Trump. There are just as many sort of Hillary Clinton lies websites that, that exist uh, out out on the Internet as well that, that are backed up by at least audio or video of her saying these things. So um, would she qualify as qualified to you? I don't like Hillary. Um, I think – However, that she is on on those issues not that much worse than an awful lot of other politicians are. I, I find her terribly uninspiring. I find her um, very sort of uh, self-interested. I, I have been bothered since the beginning that she carpetbagged her way into a Senate seat, um, and which then began her political career. Um, but no, in terms of if Trump is worse, Trump is by all means worse. Any, any whatever the issue is, you know, and Hil Hillary has plenty of issues, issue by issue, Trump, whatever her fault is, Trump is 10 times worse than she is. And so how does that play in, uh, I guess at, at a larger question, um, in terms of, uh, how this would work, what do you think about the media narrative these days? So I, um, uh, I, I'm not disagreeing with your opinions on Trump. I'm simply saying that I think they get overlooked when Hillary does it. And so to, to further extend that, I think there is an element of truth when Trump says things like fake news or CNN. Because every day, every media outlet, I'm constantly read about how you know he's on the verge of getting impeached. The Russians are running the White House. Uh, the White House is falling apart internally. Whether or not these these stories are true, it it begs a, a greater question, both of CNN and Fox News in these areas, where they effectively seem to take um, one element of truth and spin that into a much larger story that supports their left-right narrative. So where do people go or determine sort of what is the actual value statement or news in this when even the mainstream media outlets can't seem to even try to provide objective information these days? Uh, anytime you can go back to the source material, like I say in the book, um, you know, going back to source material and looking at what was originally said, uh, finding the original video, uh, finding the original statement, finding the original transcript, um, always the best thing to do. Um, any number of times, you know, uh, context is going to be important. Um, and uh, in, in the interests of driving, you know, a 24-hour news cycle, uh, you know, pundits on both sides, you know, will, will get outraged and, uh, you know, drive news stories for hours. Um by, sometimes by taking things out of context, um, and some, so, you know, some, sometimes outrage is deserved. Sometimes it's not. There, there, there are any number of as much as I, you know, 
am, am very public with my dislike of Trump. There are any number of times I, I look at a story, it's like this. I just want to roll my eyes at this. This, this, this is a non-starter. You know. And uh, so, so final question for you, uh, Lauren. Uh, the the book has been out for a few years. Do you think mm-hmm. it's achieved its aim? And and what's next for you? Yes, I think the book has uh, accomplished what I wanted to. Uh, it, it helped me, for instance, uh, get involved in skepticism in some other ways. Uh, another interview I gave in, in the wake of the book's release uh, got me involved with uh, the skeptic track here in uh, with Atlanta's Dragon Con. I've given several presentations on it in the last four years, um, each, each Labor Day weekend. Um, it's... Uh, uh, the, the feedback I've gotten from people who have read it has all also been almost universally positive. I've gotten a couple of one-star reviews on Amazon from people who uh, didn't like like m- me, uh, my position on UFOs, for instance, or something like that. Uh, <laughs> I, I got a one-star flat star earthers, review. But, yes. for, exactly. I got I got a one-star review from someone who uh, who was a conspiracy theorist who I wrote about in the book. So surprise, he didn't like the book either. Of course. Um, but. Uh, but but no, I, I've I've much appreciated. I I, I still uh, hope to be able to do more with you know skepticism and then uh, pr- promoting the ideas I had in the book before. Um, I have in the works right now, in fact, uh, a pitch. I haven't finished it up yet. Uh, st- still working on some sample writing that specifically explored some of the material that I had originally uh, had for that book to be. A little more birther specific in the in looking at the various conspiracy theories that had been raised, especially in Obama's first term, they kind of took a a back seat once he had been reelected. But because, like I was discussing earlier, a, as much of a sort of fringe online uh, environment uh, that birtherism had been, starting in way through about 2012. Uh, what it eventually gave us, to some degree, is the current president. And uh, I think that makes it fairly topical. So that's something I hope to be writing about here soon in the future. Excellent. Um, Lauren Collins, thanks for joining us today, and, and I look forward to finding out what's going to be next from you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.